So today we will be talking about <coughs> cardiovascular system, which function is a transport, transport of nutrients and oxygen to the tissues, like liver, stomach, or kidneys, and transporting wastes and carbon dioxide away from the tissues. <coughs> Three main components of cardiovascular system are heart, blood vessels, and blood within those blood vessels. So there are two circuits in the cardiovascular system, pulmonary and systemic. Pulmonary circuit, shown here, is responsible for the transport of oxygen from the lungs to the heart's heart and that which can then deliver oxygenated blood to the tissue. So essentially, deoxygenated blood reaches pulmonary circuit where oxygen from the lungs goes into the blood, while carbon dioxide from the blood goes into the lungs, and we exhale this carbon dioxide. Oxygenated blood returns to the heart, and heart pumps oxygenated blood to all the tissues in the body. And in that systemic circuit, that's a big systemic circuit, Oxygen from the blood goes into the tissues, while carbon dioxide from the tissues goes back in the blood to be transported to the lungs for exhalation. Let's take a look at the anatomy of the heart. Heart is located in the pericardial cavity. And it is covered, the heart is covered by the visceral pericardium. You can see here, visceral pericardium. The cavity from the inside is covered with two layers of parietal pericardium, so fibrous and parietal layer of serous pericardium. So parietal pericardium covers the walls of the pericardial cavity. If we would look at the layers that comprise the heart wall itself, you will notice that visceral pericardium or epicardium is the outermost layer, myocardium, a layer of the contractile cardiac muscle, is in the middle, and a thin layer of simple squamous epithelium lining the inside surface of the heart is called endocardium. Between the visceral and parietal pericardium, there is a cavity called pericardial cavity, which is filled with the fluid. This fluid surrounds the heart and allows the heart to beat without any damage. Now, heart contains four chambers, two atria and two ventricles. So the right atrium here is the receiving, ventri uh, receiving chambers. Sorry, right atrium, yes. It's the receiving chamber. These chambers are small with a thin walls of cardiac muscle, and they sit on top of the ventricles. So when blood returns from the lungs, it enters the left atrium, and when it returns from the body, it enters the right atrium. Essentially, blood that comes out of the systemic circuit, deoxygenate blood, enters the right atrium. And when the blood, oxygenated blood, returns from the ventric uh, from the lungs, it enters left atrium. So between the left and right sides of the heart is a septum, a thick wall of muscle. Now the blood vessels that deliver the blood into the right atrium are the superior and inferior vena cava, and left atrium receives the blood through the right and left pulmonary veins. Now ventricles are muscular chambers that pump the blood 
through the body or into the pulmonary circuit. So muscular left ventricle here pumps the blood into the systemic circuit while less muscular right ventricle pumps the blood to the lungs into the pulmonary circuit. The atria and the ventricles are separated by valves. So right atrium is separated from the right ventricle from the right ventricle by a valve that is called a tricuspid valve. The left atrium is separated from the left ventricle by a valve that is called a mitral or bicuspid valve. When ventricles pump the blood into the vessels, those are great vessels. So right ventricle pumps the blood into the pulmonary trunk, while the left ventricle pumps the blood into the aorta. When blood is pumped from the ventricles into the corresponding great vessels, it goes through the valves. Blood from the right ventricle goes through the pulmonary valve, while the blood from the left ventricle goes through the aortic valve. Here you can see the representation of the valves. Here you can see tricuspid valve that separates right atrium and right ventricle, three cusps, one, two, and three. And on the and here you can see bicuspid or mitral valve, one and two cusps, that separate left atrium and left ventricle. These valves are called atrioventricular valves. Now these two valves, also called semilunar valves, separate ventricles and the great vessels. Aortic valve separates left ventricle and aorta, while the pulmonary valve separates right ventricle and the pulmonary trunk. Cardiac valves make the sound called lub and dub. The first sound, or S1, is a sound caused by pressure building up in the ventricles and closing atrioventricular valves. You can see them open here and closed here. S2, second sound, is formed when ventricles relax and blood that is now in the pulmonary trunk or pulmonary arteries and the aorta flows back toward the ventricles and closes the semilunar valves. So they close and form the S2 sound. The valves snap uh, against each other and make this dub sound. If second sound is stuttering or murmuring, it indicates the malfunction of the valve. Uh, for instance, uh, the surfaces of the valve fit imperfectly, so blood can slip past them, or uh, there can be regurgitation of the blood due to incomplete closure of the valve. In this case, valves have to be replaced. Now let's discuss the blood flow through the heart. So, oxygen-poor blood, deoxygenated blood, returns from the systemic circuit into the right ventricle. From the right ventricle, in the right atrium, I'm sorry, into the right atrium. From the right atrium, it, um, and it enters right atrium through the superior and inferior vena cava. Deoxygenated blood enters from the right atrium into the right ventricle through the tricuspid valve, right ventricle, pumps the blood through the pulmonary valve into the pulmonary trunk and pulmonary arteries, which deliver deoxygenated blood to the pulmonary circuit. In the lungs, um, blood becomes oxygenated, and oxygen-rich blood returns to the left atrium via the pulmonary veins. Left atrium pumps the blood into the left ventricle via mitral valve, and from the left 
ventricle, blood is pumped through the aortic valve into the aorta, and this oxygenated blood from the left ventricle delivers oxygen to the rest of the body. Now let's talk about cardiac cycle. At the beginning of cardiac cycle, uh, heart is in the diastole. Sorry. It is in the diastole. It is completely relaxed. Ventricles are relaxed, and that's the well, that's when diastolic pressure is measured. That's the force of the blood uh, exerting on the walls of the circulatory system. Then atria undergo systole. It's called atrial contraction or atrial systole. That systole pushes the blood from atria into the ventricles. Then ventricles start to contract. This is ventricular systole, which can be divided into two phases. First is isovolumetric contraction. That's when all valves in the heart are closed. The volume of blood in the ventricles doesn't change. Then eventually pressure in the ventricles becomes higher than the pressure in the great vessels, pulmonary trunk or aorta. And ventricles eject blood into the pulmonary or systemic circuit. So systolic pressure is a force of the left ventricular systole uh, when it is measured during the, uh, the systolic phase, during the ejection, that force pushes the blood through the circulatory system. At this point, ventricles actively contract, atria relax, then ventricles start to relax, and all valves again closed, this is called isovolumetric relaxation, and eventually heart goes back to the diastole, complete diastole, and that is when ventricular filling starts again and the cycle goes on over again. So force that left ventricle generates, either during diastole or during systole, is a blood pressure. So during uh, diastole, the blood pressure is lower, it's usually around 70 to 80, and during systole, blood pressure is higher, 110 to 120 millimeters of mercury. The difference is a pulse pressure, that's what creates pulse. And high blood pressure is defined as pressure that is higher than 140 over 90. Now, heart contracts due to the electrical signals going through its muscle in so-called electrical conducting system of the heart or intrinsic conducting system of the heart. The system contains multiple pacemaker cells that set the rhythm of cardiac contractions. So first, sinoatrial node, which is the pacemaker node, generates the impulse which spreads through the walls of atria leading to depolarization of atrial muscles and contraction of the atria. Then this impulse reaches atrioventricular node. Uh, at the atrioventricular node, the impulse that was generated at the SA node is delayed. It's delayed so it doesn't reach ventricles right away. Then the impulse is conveyed into the atrioventricular bundle, bundle branches, and Purkinje fibers. Bundle, bundle branches, and Purkinje fibers, they convey electrical impulse through the septum to the walls of the ventricles and initiate ventricular contraction. It's important to understand that these nodes do not regulate the heartbeat. They maintain the heartbeat, while extrinsic controls, such as cardiac center in the medulla oblongata, they regulate the heartbeat and can increase or decrease the frequency of the heartbeats as it is necessary. You can measure an electrical activity of the heart 
using electrocardiogram. So in electrocardiogram, there are several elements that we identify. So when myocardium depolarizes during the contraction, we can detect the electrical signals that go through the cells of myocardium and record them in the EKG. The first element of EKG is P wave, which corresponds to firing of sinoatrial node and depolarization of atria. It corresponds obviously to atrial contraction. During QRS complex, ventricles depolarize and contract and atria start to repolarize and relax. During T wave, ventricles repolarize and relax. And there are a couple of elements here that are worth mentioning. PR interval or PR segment shows you the time between the atrial depolarization to the depolarization of ventricles. And QT interval here shows you the time uh, that it takes for ventricles to start contracting to completely relax. Now, there are several um, abnormalities here that are worth mentioning. For instance, if you don't see a P wave on the EKG, it means that sinoatrial node doesn't work, which means atria do not contract. If P wave is present, but QRS complex and ST segment and T wave are absent, it means that AV node did not let the electrical signal to go through into the ventricles. Ventricles do not contract. It is also called as the called a dropped beat. So let's talk about types of blood vessels. There are three types, arteries, veins, and capillaries. We're going to talk about capillaries on the next page. Uh, arteries and veins have three layers, tunica externa, tunica media, and tunica intima. Tunica externa is the connective tissue. Tunica intima is the layer of endothelial cells. And tunica media is the layer of smooth muscles. You can see that in arteries, tunica media, smooth muscle, is much more pronounced, much thicker. You can see it on this micrograph, while in the veins, it is not as big, so veins cannot maintain that perfect round shape. So as a rule, arteries always carry blood away from the heart, and as they, um, basically, they are the vessels that arise on the ventricular side of the heart. Arteries that are closer to the heart have large lumens and thick muscular walls. Those are elastic arteries that stretch and recoil with each heartbeat. As we move on from elastic arteries farther from the heart to the muscular arteries and arterioles, which are the smallest arteries, the lumen size and the thickness of the wall go down. Now, veins take the blood to the heart. The blood from capillaries is collected in the venules and then in the bigger veins. And the blood continues to flow despite a relatively low pressure in the veins. As a rule of thumb, the highest pressure is in the arteries. So the reason for it is because fluids in this case go from small vessel to a large one. There is less friction in the venular walls and there are valves in the veins that prevent the backflow uh, of the blood um, back uh, away from the heart in the veins. So considering all of that we said we can conclude that blood pressure is higher in the arteries and blood flow rate is higher in the arteries due to the fact that they have higher pressure. Also, you can see again that arteries have thicker walls. 
Now, what about the capillaries? So arteries, or smaller arteries, arterioles, lead to the capillaries, capillary beds. And wall of the capillary is quite different from arteries or veins. The walls are one cell thick. And it consists of simple squamous epithelium called endothelium. There are three types of capillaries. The least permeable, continuous capillaries, more permeable, fenestrated, and most permeable, sinusoid capillaries. So this very thin layer of uh, epithelium allows for the rapid exchange of nutrients, waste, and respiratory gases. Now, before we move on to the conversation about some cardiac pathologies, I want to highlight a few interesting moments about the circuits and the portal systems. So let's go back to a conversation of the circuits. You know, you see that there is a pulmonary circuit and systemic circuit, and systemic circuit is much larger. However, interestingly enough, the volume of blood in pulmonary and systemic circuit are the same. Both circuits carry the same volume of blood at any given moment, which explains why the pressure and the resistance in the systemic circuit is higher than the pressure and the resistance in the pulmonary circuit. Now let's go back to our portal systems. So usually, as we mentioned, blood flows from the arteries via capillaries into the veins. However, there are some situations when this pattern is modified. For instance, it is the hepatic portal system. So blood is collected from stomach and small intestines into the hepatic portal vein, which then branches into the new set of capillaries in the liver. And you can see that liver receives blood both through the hepatic artery and hepatic portal vein. This blood is mixed in the liver and then hepatic vein collects it and delivers into the vena cava. There are other um, portal systems, smaller, sort of less, not less important, just smaller portal systems in the human body. But hepatic portal system is important because it shows you how uh, slow moving blood into the capillary bed of the liver allows liver cells, hepatocytes, to clean up the blood that comes from the intestine by removing ions and compounds and enrich it with the nutrients that are required in the rest of the body. So let's talk about some issues here, hypertension, um, high blood pressure, risk factors for hypertension is age, family history, uh, being male is, is a significant um, underlying factor. Uh, sedentary lifestyle, so no, no exercise. Smoking, obesity, all of this is our risk factors for hypertension. So hypertension, that's the clinical characteristics. Pre-hypertension is blood pressure, systolic, diastolic in this range, and that's normal blood pressure. So chronic hypertension causes uh, capillaries to leak plasma into the tissues, leading to edema or even hemorrhage. Control is diet restrictions, um, exercising, quitting smoking, quitting drinking, various medications. Now atherosclerosis is the disease in which um, blood vessels are blocked or obstructed by the um, plaques that formed of cholesterol, red and white blood cells, platelets, lipids. That reduces the blood flow, as you can see on this illustration. It leads to the poor uh, perfusion of a tissue, hypoxia, uh, and if plaque dislodges, it may completely block smaller vessel, completely block the blood flow, leading to ischemia and tissue death beyond blockage.
So this, uh, another complication here that we should discuss is thrombosis and thromboembolism. So when thrombosis is formed in the larger vessel, for instance, uh, some large vein of the leg, it can more or less freely, it can dislodge and more or less freely travel through the veins, ending up in the pulmonary circulation, which will lead to pulmonary embolism, cerebral circulation, which will lead to ischemic stroke, or cardiac circulation, which will lead to myocardial infarction. Now, another interesting um, pathology here is aneurysm. So in aneurysm, due to the high pressure, the vessel balloons, so you can see aneurysm here, and that is a weak spot. The wall of that vessel is really thin. So if blood pressure suddenly increases, it may lead to the burst of the um, blood vessel. And if it is in the brain, it will be hemorrhagic stroke. Aneurysm is usually fatal. For instance, aortic aneurysm, if it bursts, will lead to massive bleeding from aorta, and blood loss is really hard to mitigate. If aneurysm is formed in the cerebral circulation, it will lead to hemorrhagic stroke, which is uh, extremely hard to treat because blood causes massive damage to the brain. Now, embolism, the thrombus that, that lodges itself into a small blood vessel in the brain, will call, cause a different type of stroke, which is a, an ischemic stroke. As a result of this, tissues will be start of oxygen and nutrients leading to um, ischemia and uh, as the result certain tissues in the brain will die leading to various symptoms from difficulty of speaking blindness to numbness weakness paralysis and sometimes even death if that same thrombus lodges itself <clears throat> in one of the coronary vessels like this blocking the coronary artery that leads to myocardial infarction the part of the tissue that is um, beyond the after the occluded artery will die to, due to the lack of oxygen. Now, angina is a temporary loss of oxygen supply to the heart. So, stable angina um, can happen when the somebody is doing strenuous activity. So that can be mitigated by quitting smoking or cha making life change, lifestyle changes, other lifestyle, ch lifestyle changes. Unstable angina occurs without any apparent stimulus and may be a sign of the um, heart attack. Now the name for angina is angina pectoris because it's in the pectoral region. Now uh, to control angina, you can use drugs like nitroglycerin, nitroglycerin, which relax the smooth muscles of the coronary arteries and blood flows smoother by the plaque. Or you can use some other methods. Balloon angioplasty, when balloon is inserted and inflates the artery, allowing for the proper passage of blood. Stent in the artery, a special stent is introduced in the artery, expanding it. Coronary bypass, when there are different grafts installed in the heart, allowing for the proper blood supply from the aorta to different parts of the heart. And of course, um, artificial heart or heart transplant. Now, last bit to talk about here are congestive heart failure in varicose veins. So here you can see the hypertrophy of the left ventricle due to the obstruction of the outflow. So what it means is left ventricle has to pump the blood <clears throat> against an enormous pressure that leads to a thickening of the left ventricular muscle and reducing the size of the left ventricle which leads to failure of the left ventricle to properly pump the blood. You remember that volumes of blood in the left and the right, uh, in the left 
uh, in the systemic circuit and the pulmonary circuit are the same. So when left ventricle fails to deliver proper amount of blood into the systemic circuit, blood gets congested, blood accumulates in the pulmonary circuit, leading to the uh, pulmonary congestion, pulmonary edema, accumulation of fluid in the lungs that leads to difficulty breathing and fatigue, increased heart rate, tachycardia, and eventually it leads to a death due to the usually lung dysfunction. If right ventricle fails, then fluid backs up in the systemic circuit and that leads to the edema in the peripheral tissues or and or portal hypertension. Now varicose veins is the situation when walls of the veins are abnormally distended. Usually it happens when um, people uh, lead sedentary lifestyle and blood pools near the valves uh, which makes the uh, walls to stretch, vessels expand and um, they become oddly shaped. Varicose veins are not necessarily intrinsically dangerous um, and usually they are recommended to be kind of, you know, doctors recommend to leave them alone. Now spider veins, uh, same varicose veins but just with the venules, smaller vessels, not the large veins. So now let's talk about the blood. Blood uh, regulates the internal environment, uh, provides the transport medium for exchanging ions, respiratory gases, hormones, nutrients with the interstitial fluid, prevents bleeding by forming clots, transports heat. Blood consists of plasma, and formed elements, which are cells. Plasma is about half of the blood volume, and formed elements are three types of cells, white blood cells, platelets, and red blood cells. So plasma maintains osmotic pressure, the blood, uh, and three types of blood cells perform three different functions. All blood cells originate in the bone marrow, red blood cells uh, their function is to deliver oxygen. White blood cells uh, protect uh, body playing a role as an immune system. The warriors and platelets help to form the blood clot. So red blood cells transform oxygen to the, to the tissue. Um, they contain protein called hemoglobin. Here you can see the structure of hemoglobin. Those are red blood cells. Um, heme group in the hemoglobin here, it is bound to iron and oxygen can be picked by this iron in the heme group. So four oxygens can be picked by one molecule of hemoglobin. When oxygen is scarce in the tissues, hemoglobin releases the oxygen, uh, supplying the tissues with a necessary respiratory gas. Red blood cells live for about four months, liver and spleen will remove red blood cells and recycle iron and recycle proteins. So we constantly produce red blood cells as we constantly destroy them. The rate of red blood cells production, erythropoiesis, is regulated by the hormones and the requirements of the body uh, in terms of the oxygen. White blood cells are responsible for defending the body against pathogens. Um, they are critical for the proper functioning immune, of immune system. There are two big types, granular and agranular blood cells. Granular blood cells are basophils, mostly responsible for the inflammation and some allergic responses. Eosinophils, responsible for protecting human body against parasites. And neutrophils, responsible for protecting, protecting the body against bacteria. Agranular blood cells include monocytes, that develop into macrophages, which uh, destroy debris, bacteria, infected cells, and so on, and lymphocytes, which are indispensable in our protection against viruses. Now, platelets are essential for formation of the blood clot. 
So when vessel is injured, platelets get activated. Okay, you can see how platelets are produced from the cell called megakaryocytes. Platelets get activated and they form a clot. And at the same time, two coagulation pathways, intrinsic and extrinsic, are activated. Intrinsic pathway is activated by the damage to the cell wall, blood cells, endothelium. Basically, the damage is contained inside of the blood vessel. While the extrinsic pathway is activated when there is a trauma to the extravascular cells, trauma to the tissues. Now, pathway involves multiple steps, which result so-called common pathway, where prothrombin is activated into thrombin, and thrombin activates fibrinogen to form fibrin, which then forms um, fibers that hold the clot together and prevent it from getting broken apart. This is called, so this whole cascade platelets being activated upon the injury forming a blood clot and then two pathways are activated leading to formation of fibrin and fibrin enforcing the blood clot. All of it is called hemostasis or clotting cascade. Now, a few words about blood types. So blood type is based on the presence of so-called agglutinogens markers on the surface of red blood cells. If there is only A marker, it's type A blood. If the marker is B, it's type B blood. If the marker, both markers are present, is AB blood. And if none are present, it's O blood type. Now, it's interesting that in the plasma, of the, the blood of a particular type, there are antibodies called anti agglutinins or agglutinins. Agglutinins target agglutinogens that are not present on that blood type. So, for instance, in a type A blood, where there is A agglutinogen in red blood cells, antibodies will target B. In the B blood type, antibodies will target A. In an AB blood type, there will be no antibodies at all. And in O blood type, which has neither A or B agglutinogen, both anti-A and anti-B agglutinins will be present. So, um, if you will mix type A with type B, uh, plasma, plasma from type A with a type B cells, will lead to clumping of type B blood. If you will mix plasma from type B and mix it with type A red blood cells, it will clump them because they have anti-A antibodies. Let me remove all the ink. If you will, interestingly enough, if you will make, if you will mix plasma from a B blood, you know, there are no antibodies, so it will not clump any blood type. This is why it is a universal recipient. While the plot, if you mix red blood cells from O with any plasma, they will never clump because they don't have antigens. So this is universal donor. However, type O people can only receive type O blood. Now, let's say a few words about some blood disorders. Uh, leukemia. Leukemia is present as an uh, abnormal number of white blood cells. Uh, it's basically cancer of the bone marrow. Uh, in this case, white blood cells are abnormally shaped here. You can see acute lymphoblastic leukemia, uh, many immature white blood cells. Here you can see chronic lymphocytic leukemia. Cells are more developed but still immature. The symptoms of leukemia, fatigue, weakness, immunity is compromised, lump, lymph nodes and spleen are enlarged. It can be very uh, rapidly developing like an acute lymphoblastic leukemia or slowly developing like chronic lymphocytic leukemia. Anemia is the reduction 
in the population of red blood cells. You can see a typical example of anemic uh, blood here at the picture three. Blood cannot carry proper amount of oxygen, which manifests itself with a fatigue, shortness of breath, weakness, and pains in the chest. Um, iron deficiency anemia is, a, uh, is caused by the low concentration of iron. Pernicious anemia is caused by the shortage of vitamin B12. Aplastic anemia is caused by inability of bone marrow to produce enough stem cells to derive red blood cells from them. And hemorrhagic anemia is the low number of red blood cells due to the blood loss. Now lastly, we're going to talk about <clears throat> sickle cell anemia and thalassemia. Sickle cell anemia is the point mutation in the gene for hemoglobin that leads to the production of hemoglobin S instead of hemoglobin A. And when oxygen concentration, oxygen pressure in the tissues is low, hemoglobin S forms long chains which leads to the sickle-shaped red blood cells. These cells cannot normally pass through the capillaries, leading to the damage of endothelium, obstruction of capillaries, decreased perfusion, in, decreased uh, blood supply to the tissue, increased hemolysis, break, breakdown of red blood cells. There are treatments, hydroxyurea or bone marrow transplant. And another condition from that similar group is thalassemia. In thalassemia, Thalassemia is usually characterized by a wide variety of mutations in a hemoglobin gene. In thalassemia, less hemoglobin is produced. There are fewer red blood cells, also some kind of uh, uh, un unusual uh, formations on the face, uh, certain anatomical features. Spleen is usually enlarged. Uh, thalassemia can lead to heart problems. Treatment is bone marrow transplant or blood transfusions. What's interesting is that patients with both diseases, sickle cell anemia and thalassemia, protected from malaria. On this picture, you can see the overlap of malaria distribution, three, and frequency for the sickle cell anemia gene. You can see that those distributions largely overlap. So uh, that is it for cardiovascular system. And our next lecture will be about the respiratory system.